Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the introduction for our 2010 education series. Uh, we would like at this point again to thank Freshwater Future, who gave us the grant to enable us to buy the license and to embark upon this, this whole process. Uh, that being said, I would like to explain the image that you see there. Um, we are in the 21st century. On the left, you will see the traditional image of sewering. On the right, of course, is the expectation that we all have. That being said, I'm going to advance to the next slide. And at this point, I would like to turn it over to our moderator, a co-moderator for the day, who's going to be doing the first part of this presentation this morning. And this is Dr. Richard Oldham. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dick Otis, and I'm, I'm sitting here in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, this is one of my first, not my first, but one of my first in, in uh, doing a webinar, and uh, it should be interesting. So I, bear with me. And it's good to see uh, old friends here. Uh, they'll keep me honest as well. So please speak up if, um, if you have any questions, uh, comments, and that sort of thing. That will only make uh, this more informative. Here we are. Your, your two presenters. Uh, Andrew Best, Executive Director of the Wastewater Education uh, 50C3 uh, organization, and, and myself, who I uh, retired recently, but find uh, retirement's a lot harder. I think, uh, Denver, I'll turn this over to you that you can explain the, uh, what uh, this series is going to be about and, and what they can expect. Again, welcome. I, I like using this image because this is our expectation these days that uh, any time we come in contact with water, it's going to be clean, it's going to be safe. Um, there, is, there is an expectation that we will not get sick from coming in contact with water. Um, the, the whole purpose of this year is to enter into a dialogue. We are particularly concerned that we seem to be very bad at getting our point of view, our message, our technology, our education sources out to the general public, to elected officials, and to people who are in a position uh, to influence planning decisions. It, it's, it's probably, I probably get in trouble for saying this, but we seem to be a lot better at talking amongst ourselves than we do in reaching out to the general public. And it's the general public and their elected officials that end up making the decisions about how we spend the scarce dollars we have as units of government. So that being said, um, we decided to use the medium that is the least expensive, that is the most easily accessible. Even people who can't actually um, log into a webinar because of the, the bandwidth it issues, um, except with Illuminate, there is a sliding access software that allows people, even on dial-up, to access our, our web meeting space. But they'll also be published, which means that you'll be able to go to a website and watch them at your leisure. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Dave. Well, thank you, Dendra. I think it'd be nice if we, we could all introduce ourselves. Um, you now know who I am uh, and uh, Dendra, and you even got to see us. So that's something that we have over you. But uh, Craig, why don't you introduce yourself and pass it on to Larry and Mary. What we're talking about uh, during this uh, webinar really is uh, wastewater treatment. But too often we think about wastewater uh, by itself and not part of the whole water resource uh, uh, area. And we need to do better at that. As this picture shows, we, and as Dendra had uh, suggested there, we, we take it for granted. We, we expect water to be clean and safe uh, for whatever use we have. And then typically we just use it once and discharge it. But where does that water go? And uh, what happens to it after we're done with it? And, and those are the things that we need to examine um, as part of our wastewater treatment. 
Fortunately, uh, water is renewable. It is a finite resource. There's only so much water on the earth, and uh, we don't won't get much more. Um, but it is renewable. Uh, through the water cycle, it, it is renewed and replenished and uh, safe again for use. But we have to be careful about that because uh, we can easily overwhelm uh, the cycle. If you take a look at uh, our water use, our domestic water use, you can see where things are, how things divide up. Whereas the toilets and showers uh, account for most of the water used. A typical uh, uh, person uses anywhere from 45 to 70 gallons per day. Uh, and um, much of that use, as you can see, is nearly half of it or more uh, is in toilet and shower and bath and that sort of thing. So it's, it's water that uh, is not very contaminated when we discharge it. And that's, that's something to consider. If you look at the all water use, uh, about 70% of it is used in agriculture. Another 20% is used by industry. 10% uh, is domestic. And, and that's what we're looking at here. But if you consider what we actually use because of products that we buy uh, or other things that we do outside the home, uh, that number goes up, and it can be anywhere from 100 to 250 gallons per person per day in water that we use, either directly or indirectly. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem that, the, that our current water practices are sustainable. Uh, the water use in, in the country is, is lumpy. Uh, in other words, we, we tend to mine the water where we are in terms of groundwater or extract the water from surface waters uh, in our normal course of, of, of living. And we lose, we lose a lot of water that way and begin to overwhelm that water cycle. If you look at what it amounts to, this glass represents uh, the total water in the world. Uh, so that's approximately what, one a trillion uh, gallons of water somewhere in there. But of that, 97% is salt water. The rest is tied up in ice and groundwater. If you look at that 2.3% uh, that is fresh water, of that, uh, 69 to 70% is in glaciers. And in permafrost, 30% is in groundwater, uh, 0.03 is atmospheric, and 0.01 is actual surface water. So when we when we look at what we have available for use, it's uh, a very small percentage of this 2.53 uh, of fresh water. Approximately a, a third of that, if we count groundwater and surface water, uh, that's 30% of two and a half percent, so a third. Not very much water that we have to work with. Now looking at it in a comparison here, the glass again representing the, all of the world's water at 2.3, 2.5% in the green area here is, is what is fresh. And of that, this little dot here represents the 0.01 that's say the available surface water. Fortunately, there is the water cycle that can clean things up, and, but we have to be careful about what we do because what, what's happening today is we, we tend to intercept that cycle. Uh, we intercept it and uh, take that water and try to reuse it before it's fully uh, renovated. And that can lead to a number of different problems. Uh, but it puts a more and more of a load on, on that cycle to keep, thing, to keep water clean and fresh. What we're talking about, of course, is the, the uh, on-site wastewater uh, treatment and disposal. And 
this is what a, a typical installation looks like, and most of us feel fairly comfortable with it. We can uh, we get it installed and we bury it, and, uh, and then we don't think much about it. Uh, that's the case for, for, for many, and it's only when problems begin to occur because maintenance isn't uh, provided that we begin to have problems. Yeah. So what I what we thought we would do is just get some uh, uh, feedback from you as to how you feel about things. We need to know what we're doing, and uh, if if we don't, we'll end up doing something else. So uh, we need to think about this. So what is your opinion about septic systems? Is it something that uh, you you feel comfortable with, or do you have other other kinds of problems? Um, such as this. This is this is from a website uh, pulled off uh, from a, a state's um, uh, on-site wastewater program. And look up here. Uh oh, the yard looks like this. Zebra stripes in the line. Look at that big dollar sign there. You need to pump septic tank often. It's bad. Pulleys pooling uh, sewage on the top of the ground. Worse than that, septic backing up in the basement. Now, why would any of us want to use one of these systems? Um, so what is uh, from each of you, if you could just uh, go on. Yeah, Craig, go ahead. Good. Um, well, you know, I'm obsessing on this uh, point because I think we've ignored so much of what is what Ben Grumbles in 2005 acknowledged was probably the second largest polluter of groundwater. But the question is, um, as I read the literature, um, the notion that we were going to sewer the country back in the 1970s led to an awful lot of EPA information characterizing septic systems as needing to be eliminated um, uh, with the notion that uh, they weren't even viable in, in a density of more than 16 or 20 per, what was it? I'm wrong. It's um, uh, one every some, something like one every four or five acres. I, the numbers are bad. Um, but the, the, some of that language that came, uh, some of the literature that came out of the 1980s seems to have led to an improvement in septic systems in Massachusetts, the the code changed considerably in the in the 1990s, um, but but we still permit septic systems on Cape Cod where we need to hit three on total nitrogen. So septic systems have a um, have a, a murky history, and certainly policy seems to change around them as um, as policy changes around central sewer. And um, and so I wondered if you'd comment on that and comment on and, and comment. They, these are also done under the health code, and I don't see that the health code contributes anything to um, achieving some of the larger policy issues that I think sewers need to. We, well, I don't mind sewer, but we need to achieve like water resource management and so forth. Would you comment on the history and the, and and? and and whether or not there's any credibility behind Grumble's observation? <laughs> yeah, well, you, you raised a couple of good points here, Craig. And, and uh, yeah, to back up just a little bit, first of all, when the, when the Clean Water Act was passed, uh, EPA only took over jurisdiction of navigable waters. Uh, they did not take over on-site systems. Uh, that was left to the states, and the states often pushed that down to the counties. And uh, you just have a whole host of different rules and, and regulations that have to be followed. Well, and, and part of that gets uh, led to the fact that we had a lot of failures. And the systems weren't being put in properly. Uh, my opinion, I think it was misconstrued as, as causing the contamination of groundwater. And uh, if you can't figure out where that's that bad stuff came from, then uh, it must have been from septic tanks. It, it seems that they've had a, a bad rap that way. Now, what led up to what you were talking about in terms of uh, a change in policy and so forth, 
because EPA in the, in the wastewater uh, division has no jurisdictions over these systems, the drinking water people got involved. Now, the drinking water people can do just about anything. They can uh, prevent uh, systems from being put in or, or banning them. And that's, in fact, what they tried to do with the class 5 injection wells. Uh, program uh, that was introduced, I can't remember now exactly when it was, but it was in the 90s. And I remember that we put up quite a battle and, uh, and the Office of Wastewater Management also did because it was recognized uh, that on-site systems are a necessary form of wastewater treatment and uh, that, that the uh, entire country will not be sewered. Uh, so on-sites become a critical component uh, of that infrastructure. And what uh, Office of Wastewater Management said is, let's, let's back off trying to ban these things like the drinking water was going to do. The drinking water said that they, were, uh, they would ban anything that was larger than 20 people for an on-site system. Um, Office of Wastewater Management said, let's back off. Uh, let us see if we can't encourage better operation and maintenance of these systems uh, to ensure that they're doing what, what they need to do. And, and so now all, all the, uh, the injection well program is requiring is that larger systems are registered. Uh, so it's, it, the problem hasn't gone away, but they're, they're taking a look at it. And uh, in the course of that, uh, with, with that EPA push from the Office of Wastewater Management, uh, I, th I think we saw it, are beginning to see the results of it in, in better policies and, and better rules. Now, you mentioned the health codes and, and so forth, and of course, that's where all our rules uh, grew up in. It was the public health service that uh, uh, really wrote the early uh, ordinances for uh, counties uh, to use. And uh, in, in many cases, the health departments still uh, control this, uh, but in many cases that's no longer true. The concern for the contamination and so forth uh, that we had prior, it's, it's now looking at more other elements, uh, the, the nutrients and the nitrates and, and uh, the pathogens that are a concern, which we never really looked at before. So there's, there's still some, some concerns ahead, but I, I do see things beginning to change. And uh, I think one of the areas that, that's been neglected and we have to spend more time at is, is regulatory reform. So that's kind of a long answer to, to uh, what you said or asked, but um, uh, I, I hope that answered it and maybe we can t discuss it some more as we move on. Um, some things that, that you should be aware of, and, and that is that a properly installed and maintained septic system provides a, a higher level of treatment than the most secondary uh, municipal treatment plants. So they, because of the soil, because we utilize the soil in treatment, we get excellent uh, removals of, of pathogens, uh, well, at least people in, indicators. Uh, we don't often track pathogens uh, um, uh, or viruses or parasites. Um, but for the most part, uh, they seem to be removed. We don't see the big problems. Uh, any problems with that? Uh, the what, what these systems also do is recharge the local groundwater, and oftentimes we're using well water, the groundwater, for our drinking water, and we're returning it uh, from where we took it, uh, which is not true with uh, uh, traditional municipal systems, which rely on gravity primarily for collection, which takes water down to the bottom of the basin where it's treated and then discharged. So that water is typically lost from the basin. Uh, also, with sewers, you can begin to drain the groundwater due to infiltration uh, when, when sewers are leaking. Of course, they also leak out, which uh, is raw waste that goes out into the, into the soil and potentially can get down into the groundwater. So uh, there's just not all good things about uh, sewers, uh, just as there's not all the things about on sites, but looking at them together and picking out the one that's more uh, uh, effective for a given application is what we need to do. Um, but we do have some issues there, and, and one of them is uh, in terms of uh, quality of living, where 
you're often told if you have a septic system that you can't have a garbage grinder or you can't have a uh, a spa uh, because your your system isn't designed for it. Well, we could design them for it, and that's something that that has to be uh, considered. Treatment costs are lower because we don't we use the simulative capacity of the um, environment, and uh, the there's small discharges <coughs> that are scattered throughout the watershed, and so we we don't have to treat it to the high degree that we would with a municipal plant that has a point discharge with uh, millions of gallons going out at one point. Also, it's important to note that the uh, risks from malfunctions are low uh, with on-site systems um, because it isn't much water uh, each day and that makes it easier to manage and repair. It's, it's not a, a, a huge costly uh, and time-consuming uh, time operation. And then uh, we don't have to build an excess capacity as we do with uh, sewers uh, to anticipate additional growth. Um, we can build as needed. But one of the one of the problems that we have when we begin planning is that we look at wastewater treatment as either having sewers or on sites. It's one or the other. We don't look at it as something that we could <clears throat> use both together to come up with the best solution. Another is economies of scale. We're, we're told, uh, put in these, these sewers, you can treat more people, that will reduce the cost for each person, and it's going to be better. Um, but that's not always the case either. Economies of scale can work both ways. Bigger may be better in some instances, but smaller can be better in others. We've we've grown up with sewers, um, even though they've only been around for maybe 100, 150 years. Um, uh, but what they did initially was get the water out away from people where you discharge it remotely. And that's typically what we did. And that's why we had the Clean Water Act passed in 72, was because that's mostly what we did with wastewater. We just collected it and then dumped it into a river. There might have been uh, primary treatment provided, but for the most part, uh, that was it. And uh, the federal government stepped in and said, states, you aren't taking care of your problems. Uh, we're going to. And uh, that's when the states lost jurisdiction over municipal treatment. And uh, that's how we uh, we made a big uh, a big step. As I, as I mentioned, there's uh, there's shortcomings to sewers, and uh, we have to be we have to be cognizant of that. There's uh, exfiltration, infiltration uh, that can occur that can contaminate groundwater and cause other problems. When there, when there is an issue, it can be a significant issue. Also, it, it can be uh, uh, overlooked. We may, we, we may not see some of the problems uh, that are occurring. I, here in Madison, Wisconsin, we had a, uh, a lift station malfunction and it was uh, discharging water over a bike path and had gone on, on and on into a wetland and that had gone on for over a month before it was discovered. Um, so things aren't perfect on either side. It's a matter of looking at the best option, looking at it as, as a continuum of options uh, that can be used and oftentimes they can be put together to, to uh, make the best option. Looking at a traditional system in the past, what, what we were doing was just trying to avoid direct contact uh, between people and the wastewater. And so we required that it be below ground. The septic tank uh, ultimately was, was used to remove solids and it would, the liquid would go out onto the, the gravel trench and uh, be dissipated into the soil beneath it. And for the most part, that would move vertically ground, uh, downward until it hit the groundwater and then would move laterally. Well, in one direction might be the well. And so here's where Health stepped in again and said, okay, you're going to locate your well, preferably up gradient, and uh, some distance, 75 feet, 100 feet uh, away from the, um, the uh, on-site system. And, and that prevented real problems. Uh, so water 
quality was was more or less uh, maintained, and and we didn't and we didn't have the problems, and it's all because <clears throat> all because of that soil in between, that with the the uh, geochemical and biochemical reactions that are going on uh, can remove most of the pollutants uh, or transform them so that they're they're harmless. But here's here's an example of what can be done when you look at both of them. Now, this is this is looking at a planning area uh, where it's a small community where you have clusters of homes in kind of a commercial district down here, and, and maybe a, a residential area up here with uh, more urban density housing and so forth. Now, in the past, when when engineers <coughs> would look at a situation like this. They could, they could see well, you know, it might be cost effective to to sewer here where we have a high density uh, of of structures uh, that wouldn't be too costly. But all the rest of you, uh, you're left on your own. Uh, the whole idea with the, the planning effort through the Clean Water Act really was to provide solutions for everybody. But if you if you couldn't be served by sewer, you're left with your on-site systems, and that didn't necessarily uh, improve the problem. Um, this shows a, a more distributed treatment uh, alternative where, yeah, we'll sewer the uh, commercial district and we'll sewer this subdivision over here. But then the remaining of these homes will be within the management district. And those systems will be operated and maintained by that wastewater uh, uh, facility. They may even take over ownership from the property owners. So now the responsibility is totally with the district and not with the individual uh, homeowners. So those are the kinds of options that we need to be looking at, utilizing what's best in a given situation. The other is, is that what we tended to treat unsewered areas as being second class because they, they uh, don't have the same assurances of, of clean water. Uh, they don't know what their neighbors are doing. They can't use garbage grinders and spas. Uh, they have all these restrictions plus the responsibility of having to operate and maintain their system, uh, which isn't something that they really care to do because most people are squeamish about uh, wastewater. So we need to be able to provide the services that people need just like they would with sewers. There's no reason why people uh, need to see a difference with using on-site systems versus sewers. Now, there are trade-offs. Uh, there might be something located in your backyard, but not necessarily if you look at using uh, small clusters of, of uh, homes uh, with a remote site for treatment and dispersal. I talked a little bit about the, the things that we're concerned about today in that what we weren't before. Uh, in the past, we were just concerned about uh, eliminating any direct contact of wastewater with, with people. Uh, today, we are concerned more about uh, nitrates in the groundwater, which lead to nitrates in the drinking water, or nutrients that are reaching surface waters. And, and of course, any, any uh, pathogens and more and more uh, concern for viruses and, and so forth. So there, there are those issues. Uh, but septic systems are more than septic tanks. Now, they, they, can, they can be designed to handle all these different uh, uh, treatment requirements. Uh, they, they become more costly, uh, but they're still effective and uh, be cost effective in terms of looking at a, a, a large municipal system, uh, depending on things like housing density and topography and that sort of thing. So we, we can make them do what they need to do. It's, it's just a matter of which ones do we select. And when we talk about clusters, we have to talk about uh, um, how we're collecting the wastewater and where, it's, where is it going to go. We traditionally use gravity sewers, which is depicted in that top illustration. And, and you can see that uh, a 
depending on the topography, in this case a, a hilly one, uh, that uh, there can be deep burial of those sewers, uh, which is very costly. Whereas we can use alternatives, such as pressure sewers shown below, uh, that uh, collect the wastewater. They can be uh, raw wastewater in the terms you know, in uh, using grinder pumps, or it can be effluent sewers where we just collect septic tank effluent and uh, just a septic tank is left on the property to be pumped uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and by having a uniform berry on the main lines, you're saving uh, significant costs. So there's, there's lots of options out there that we can uh, achieve what we want to achieve. And we can begin to look how we're, we're doing our land use planning. Uh, this is looking at distributed treatment using clusters and individual homes. Now, if you look on the diagram on the left there, that, that's traditional um, uh, planning, where we have individual large lots uh, for, for single family homes with individual septics and, and wells. Or we can put urban density in with lots of green space, as shown on the right. Uh, where you have groups of homes, and those groups of homes can be served by clusters and use some of the greenway uh, to uh, disperse the, the wastewater. So all these options become open to us with our improved technology and, and more importantly with the improved management that would go along with it. So the, the, the whole point is to have something that's sustainable and safe. And uh, that means we, we have to begin looking at uh, our wastewater, what we're doing with it. Uh, it also means that we should be considering better ways of handling that wastewater uh, and reusing it. Uh, over in Israel, for example, they, uh, they don't have much water to work with. Um, so they've gone to uh, renovating the water and using it for irrigation. So they don't have to bring it up to potable uh, levels. They could, they could just bring it up to what's necessary for agriculture. And every gallon that they save in doing that is a gallon of potable water that's saved. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's a big thing to them because water is, is very scarce. Uh, it, it's also going to be a big thing for us to be able to do those kinds of things. So I, I, that's uh, just a very quick run through of some of the various options that will be uh, uh, discussed in this series of webinars. And uh, to, to finish this off, to talk about what, what we can expect in the future, I'll, I'll give it back to you, Dinner. Thank you, Dick. Um, what I'm going to do now is run through some of the things that we're going to be covering in this year. And obviously, we're not going to be doing this alone. We'll be looking for partners. We'll be looking for people who are willing to donate their time and share their expertise and their knowledge with the general public. This here is a, a list of some of the things that we are definitely going to be covering. Small community planning. It seems to be um, a, a definite lack of being able to reach out to township planning authorities, regional planning. Uh, here in Northwest Michigan, we're quite fortunate. We have the Northwest Michigan Council of Governments that has uh, regional planning. And we also he here have a movement called the Grand Vision, which is trying to look at where, where do we want this community to be in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And an interesting concept that came out of the community-wide survey was that people prefer to see development focused on what they term the small urban, the village type settings. Um, we seem to like living by our neighbors here in Northwest Michigan, which is a good thing. Um, it always surprised me when I first moved here from the United Kingdom the space between where people live. And uh, 
obviously the more spread out people are, the less risk you have from contamination, but then equally um, we are our neighbors' keepers. We'll be looking at all the decentralized options. And decentralized, I'm also looking at the word distributed. Uh, there are many types of technologies out there that a lot of people outside the industry are just not aware of. The fact that you can have individual decentralized distributed options within centralized systems, that when you have a catastrophic failure, it shouldn't take the whole system down, but maybe just one portion of it. If you have a portion of your system that has a specific need for a specific user, perhaps it's a heavily industrialized or a particular type of discharge, does it make, doesn't it make sense to treat it at that point? We're going to be looking specifically at water conservation and particularly how we have traditionally looked at water as just a means to flush our filth away. We can't do that anymore. We'll be looking at the environmental and the public health issues and the issues of emerging concern that what we need to remember, and Dick touched on this a little bit, is that our wastewater systems were designed to deal with human waste. They weren't designed to deal with and treat and safely eliminate all of the man-made compounds that we've uh, introduced into our daily lives over the last hundred years. We'll be looking, too, at the impact that EPA has on smart growth, on water infrastructure as a means to uh, provide affordable solutions for small communities. That there comes a point where a large system may provide the better alternative, but it becomes so prohibitively expensive that it never is never actually constructed. As Dick talked about, um, this planet is facing a water crisis. Regardless of how heavy rain we've had here in our region over the last uh, two or three weeks, on average, we're still running five to six inches below our normal precipitation. We're seeing a change in how the climate is distributing water. And that means that there are going to be a lot more water-starved areas. And this was a projection that I saw here about last year. And I understand now that that estimate has risen to 39 states that are anticipating local, regional, or statewide water shortages. We're also an EPA water sense partner. So we're going to be talking quite seriously about the effort of water sense and their uh, 2010 tour. And just to remind ourselves, our, our absolute capacity to consume water, and even at a greater rate than almost anywhere else in the, in the entire world, we are uh, water hogs. There's no other way to describe it. I remember when I first moved here, uh, I came from what I thought was not particularly challenged or water-deprived area, but I look at the, the consumption of water here, and it's, it's unbelievable. So as I said, um, next week we will be kicking off our series for uh, water conservation on Thursday, the 29th at 11 a.m. Eastern. We have Kerry McElhinney, who is the Water Sense Coordinator from Region 5. And if you go to epa.gov slash water sense, you will see the We're for Water 2010 tour has started. We're going to be looking at where water comes from and where it goes and the advisability, the strong advisability, not to shift water resources within watersheds, that each of them is our own uh, ecosystem. Each of them is highly dependent upon where the water comes in to that system. Uh, last year, we finished up a regional infrastructure survey, and through that, Northwest Michigan Council of Governments did some mapping for us. And the green boundaries here, the rectangular boundaries, are the county lines. But the, the 
the ones that look a little bit right, rivers here, are actually the watershed boundaries. And that shows the receiving bodies of water and where all of their water comes into it on the surface. But also the pale pink and the dark red is the, the groundwater catchment. This is where the interrelated water resources are. And so when we look upon how we sewer, how we collect wastewater for any particular area, we need to appreciate that wastewater is, in fact, a means to recharge the water cycle, as Dick Otis mentioned earlier. And we can't treat the two things as separate. We're going to be looking at this, this whole interrelationship between the natural water, water resources and our impact upon it. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the excellent documentary that was done in conjunction with WEF and NACWA and a, a number of other institutions, produced a PBS documentary called Liquid Assets. Next week, we're going to be looking at the impact of the wastefulness of when infrastructure fails. And interestingly enough, uh, we just got a notice from Clean Water American Alliance of a one voice for water campaign that is also being echoed by WEF, the Water Environment Federation. And we're going to be looking at the impact of large infrastructure failures and how possibly decentralized and distributed water can mitigate that impact. And when we look at the distributed and decentralized options, we talked earlier that these aren't just little holes in the ground in the backyard of homes that are situated on one acre, five acre lots. When we talk about the current state of technology, there is no reason that you can't drop one of these plants into an integrated water resource management plan. And this is Dockside Green. It is a development on, in Vancouver. It was part of the redevelopment of Vancouver for the uh, recent Winter Olympics. This is a, a project that was done by the Fidelis Group. And as you can see, this is a very urban area. And I think sometimes we tend to forget that on-site distributed decentralized options are not just for domestic properties. They're for small industrial complexes. They're for commercial entities. We have as many commercial on-site and decentralized systems in our region, which is fairly remote and spread out and not, in, not as much um, sewered across the municipality as, as downstate or in larger municipal areas. Um, and many of those commercial and industrial properties actually rely upon on-site systems. <clears throat> the interesting thing about Dockside Green is what you're looking at there is part of the wastewater system. And I remember listening to an uh, explanation of the designers for this, that when it was first proposed, people were horrified. Nobody would ever want to live next to something like this. And well, yes, indeed they do, because this is the finished product. It's beautiful. It's clean. It doesn't smell. And as you can see, people are really happy to live there. We're going to be looking at the cost of supplying water and clean water and taking away wastewater, that we have transportation costs. And if indeed we are using precious water resources just to transport human and industrial waste, are we indeed still thinking in terms of the 19th century? We're going to be looking at the water energy nexus. The relationship between the water we use and the power it takes to generate the transportation and the treatment systems. The, uh, this is also obviously a, a conjunction with EPA water sense, is that when we save water, we are saving the cost of generating electricity and we're limiting, we're restricting the amount of electricity we have to generate. And when so many communities are debating the, the, the benefits of the different types of generation, coal fire plants, biomass, ethanol plants, 
uh, oftentimes we don't actually consider that the cheapest form of energy we have is the energy we're already generating. And that one way to uh, make our energy go further is to actually conserve water. We're in the education business. And I think everyone who's here today is in the education business. And what we need to consider here is reaching out to ordinary people. We do a number of education outreach workshops. We go to county fairs. This was a presentation we did every year that the Michigan Energy Fair was here in Northwest Michigan. It's that people have an inherent capacity to grasp difficult subjects. And nothing appalls me more than to hear the comment, well, there's no point in talking about that to other people, ordinary people. They just won't understand it. Well, yes, they do understand it. And for the most part, it's because it impacts them. And it impacts them in their pocketbook. It impacts them in their ability to use their property and to feel safe in their neighborhoods. We won't be doing this alone, obviously. We're an organization that believes in cooperation and collaboration. There are a number of in entities out there that have vast resources that we can tap. What we're hoping to do is just to become a clearinghouse, to be able to show and to, to give people a one-stop access. If we don't have it, you could probably go to the NARA website and find it. Are you looking for a technical paper? You probably find that from the Decentralized Water Resources Collaborative. WEF, WORF, NORT. There are many organizations that have the answers. And for ordinary citizens just looking for information, they're all, almost overwhelmed by the amount of information out there. They just need someone to be basically the reference librarian for the wastewater industry and show that, yes, indeed, you do have options. And I want to put this slide back in. This is one that Dick had used earlier in his uh, presentation, that, yes, indeed, this is the reason we're in business. And too often, I hear wastewater being categorized as the issue, as the problem, as something we need a solution to. And what we need to do as wastewater professionals and wastewater educators is to say that we're not the problem, we're the solution. Uh, we are not the villains here. We are the people that are spending an inordinate amount of time and effort and research and we're committing dollars because we believe in clean water. We believe in recycling wastewater. And this image on the bottom reminds me exactly of what I see when I walk down to my own lake that I live by. This is, I want to be able to safely put my feet in the lake and not worry about what might be in there. So on that happy note, um, this is our contact information. I'm going to leave this up here for a little bit so that everyone has a chance to, to make notes on this. I really want to thank Dick Otis uh, for agreeing to do this. I know that being a virtual presenter can be a little bit intimidating, can be a little bit outside of your, your normal uh, mode of presenting, Dick. But um, one of the things that we will be doing is we're going to be doing a primer for anyone who's thinking about doing a virtual presentation. And I will uh, post that information if anybody would like to attend, uh, just to make sure that we have your email address. And the main thing to consider when you're doing a virtual presentation, as you've noticed today, is that people want to see visual presentation of information. Sometimes when we do power, I know we've all probably suffered through a death by PowerPoint. And I've personally nodded off a couple of times when I've been bombarded with vast arrays of table information and spreadsheets and graphs. And it's, it's totally outside of my comprehension to read some of that when it's so small on such a large screen. Uh, in the virtual world, as you've noticed, when we can enable your microphones or the chat window, we can enable your video uh, connections if you have them. This is uh, exactly the same as sitting around the table with your friends having a, having a discussion. 
And again, we would like to thank Freshwater Future for giving us the grant to enable us to do this. And a reminder that obviously we're a nonprofit organization. We are doing this as a public service for the public good. Uh, we generate our income from donations and from providing education programs. So obviously, if you felt that this presentation was of value to you and you'd like to support us, the link to our online donation, which is totally secure, it's done through GuideStar, uh, is available off our website or from here, or as a footnote for any of the um, presentations that uh, you've received for us by email. And of course, this session is being recorded. It will be posted to our website. We hope that you take that link and send it to just about anybody that you think should see it, anybody that you think should be a, a presenter in the course of this year, anybody who has a project that's been successful, anybody that needs to just take a step outside of that comfort zone. And uh, let's welcome them into the 21st century. Thank you, gentlemen, and we're going to sign off and end the recording now, but please stay on the line a little bit longer.